So the more responsibility you accept, the more control you have, the more control you have, the greater freedom you have. You're about to hear a life-changing speech from Brian Tracy. Relax, take notes, and watch this entire video so you don't miss anything that can have a huge impact on your life. Negative emotions, we say that this is responsible and this is irresponsible. And everybody is on a graph somewhere in between these two. You're either irresponsible is you uh, see everybody else is responsible for your life or you're totally responsible. The top 10% of people are totally responsible. These are leaders and you can be a leader without followers. You can be a leader without a staff. A leader is a person who behaves like a leader and a leader is someone who takes total responsibility. Now. The more responsibility you accept, the more control you feel you have over your life. Not only physical and financial control, but emotional control. You feel you are in charge, and the more control you have, the more freedom you have. If you were to ask people why they want to start their own business, why they want a lot of money, if you ask them over and over again, they go, the final question they will always give you is to be free. We all want to be free. We love freedom. No human being has ever said, I have too much freedom, please take some away from me. There are politicians who believe that members of the, of the voting public have too much freedom and they believe that they have been elected to take that freedom away by taxes and regulation. But there's never a person who says, I have too much freedom, please tax away my income, please regulate me and constrain my behavior so that, that I do things that you think are good for me. When you put it like that, people, nobody would ever say that. And yet this is one of the great dilemmas of the day. So the more responsibility you accept, the more control you have, the more control you have, the greater freedom you have. And the greater freedom you have the more positive emotions you have. So there's a direct one-to-one -one link between responsibility and control, freedom, and positive emotions. At the bottom end of the spectrum, irresponsibility leads to a lack of control, feeling out of control, a lack of freedom, you feel controlled by other people, and negative emotions. Now I spent 4,000 hours and several years of my young life studying the concept of negative emotions. This is some of the most important work that has ever been done based on people all over the world because the only thing that stands between you and a fabulous life are negative emotions, fear and negative emotions. If you have no negative emotions, since nature abhors a vacuum, what will your mind be filled with? If you have no negative emotions, the mind does not remain empty. What does it fill with? It fills with positive emotions of love and happiness and joy and exhilaration. So the great business of life is to eliminate negative emotions. And eliminating negative emotions is the key to unlocking the power of your subconscious and superconscious minds. So how do we do that? Well, I figured out how. And it works like a dam. So we say here, the negative emotion tree. Now this is my creation. The negative emotion tree is something that I designed. And in the negative emotion tree, what you have, let's say this is the negative emotion tree that you have here and then you have the trunk, and then you have the root system. And here's the ground, all right? Now, in the negative emotion tree grow the fruits of the negative emotion tree, which are anger and fear and doubt, and then there is jealousy, the green-eyed the green, the green monster, then there's envy. Do you know that envy is the primary motivating force of most modern politics? Is those who have less envy those who have more? and vote for people who promise to take it away from them. And then her twin sister, resentment, oh, envy and resentment go around together, arm in arm. And then, and, and then there's, uh, uh, there's uh, self-doubt, self and there's, uh, uh, there's all kinds of fears, and there's about 54 negative emotions. And these are sort of like trees. These are like fruits in the trees. So how do you get rid of the negative emotions? Well, we say the first thing you do is you starve the roots. You starve the root system, because if you starve the root system, the tree will shrivel up and die. So there are two essential factors that keep negative emotions, uh, that create them and keep them alive. The first is justification. And justification is where you feel that you are justified in your negative emotion. As a matter of fact, justification is where you say, hey, I'm entitled to this negative emotion. Because of what this person did and what this person said and what this person said to me, I'm justified. And what we do is we talk around, we talk, we drive, as we drive around, we have a continual ongoing conversation thinking of all the reasons why we're justified in being angry, upset, and negative about this person. That's all we think about is I'm entitled to this emotion. The other, the other uh, factor that creates negative emotion, whoops, is identification. 
Identification is taking things personally. If we can't take things personally, then what happens is we cannot attach any negativity to it. If it's not personal, if so, for example, if someone uh, robbed a, a store in Bangladesh um, two weeks ago and took all the money of the poor people, we don't suffer any negative emotion from that because we don't take it personally. We look at un unfortunate experiences that happen in the world, earthquakes and tsunamis and so on, but we don't get emotional about them because they don't really affect us. How many people went to bed tossing and turning and weeping over the Japanese tsunami and the shutdown of the nuclear reactor? Well, we read it in the paper and then we just watch something else on TV, go to the comic section or sports. I mean, to us, there's no emotion attached to it because we don't take it personally. And so if you stop justifying and creating reasons why you're entitled to the negative emotion and you stop identifying, your negative emotions begin to shrivel and die. Now, how do we starve the fruits of the negative emotion tree? We become non-judgmental. If you can become non-judgmental, in which case you simply refuse to judge. You simply refuse, like they say, that prejudice is prejudgment. And so what you do is you don't judge. In the Bible, uh, which, is a, which is a book that gives a lot of ideas on peace of mind, it says, judge not that you be not judged. For with, other, for, for with whatever judgment you mete out, you shall be judged with all. In other words, if you judge other people, they'll judge you. So what you do is you judge not. And if you don't take a side or an opinion, you have no emotion attached to it. It disconnects the emotion completely. So when you hear something, don't get upset or angry about it, just don't judge. You say, well, let's get all the facts. I have worked with uh, great leaders whose companies face tremendous crises. And in every case, they go as calm as, as water. They're calm and they're placid and they don't judge. They say, well, let's see exactly what happened. And so they ask questions. I've written a book on this called, uh, it's called, uh, it was going to be called Crunch Time. They called it uh, Crunch Point. But what it basically says is it taught people stop the clock, stay calm, get the facts. And they don't judge. They don't get angry. They don't get upset. They don't get worked up. They stay calm. And the measure of how successful you are as a person is how calm you can remain when there's turbulence in the world around you, as opposed to getting caught up immediately. The second thing is identifying. Don't take things personally. Is, and so we say here, we become non-judgmental. And second of all, we disidentify, we practice detachment. The entire Buddhist religion, by the way, which affects about 600 million people in the world today, and which has some beautiful precepts, is detachment. It's non-attachment. It's only when we become attached to an outcome, when we become attached to money, when we become attached to a relationship, when we become attached to a job, it's only when we become attached and become emotionally caught up in it that it can cause us any unhappiness or anger or resentment or negativity. That's why it's so important to stand back and detach emotionally so you don't get upset about it. And you say, well, it's just like when you think of things that happened in the past, you say, well, things just happen. Simple as that. Things just happen. And we say that. Things just happen. Well, this happened, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, things happen. You know, so, you know the old one? You, rhymes with spit happens. Yeah. yeah, stuff happens. And if you can say that, then you remain calm. Now, here's an interesting point, is calmness is what leads to peace of mind. Calmness is also coextensive with self-esteem, self-confidence, effectiveness, creativity. When you become emotionally involved in anything, all of your creative, your higher mental powers shut down and you revert to fight or flight, your limbic system, fear, anger, and so on. As long as you become emotionally involved, you cannot think clearly. There's a line from Francis Bacon, it says, where it maketh a man who can in no way be true to his own ends. In other words, we get so excited. So the key is to stay calm. Whew. That's why they say take a deep breath, count to 10, stay calm, detach, get the facts, don't get upset, don't get involved. Well, this is how we starve the negative emotions. You'll find that people who have no negative emotions are much calmer and much more positive than others. However, there's something even better. And that is the key to ridding yourself of negative emotions is to cut down the trunk of the tree is to cut down the trunk of the tree, which is blame. And blame is, lies at the root of 99% of negative emotions. Is we find that if this is blame, this is blame, we cut down the tree. And it's almost as if these negative emotions were lights in a Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree is plugged into the wall. Is if you unplug a Christmas tree light from the wall, what happens to all the lights simultaneously? They all go out. And when you stop blaming, all your negative emotions stop. And if, as long as you're not blaming, your negative emotions stop. You have no negative emotions. And at that moment, your mind starts to fill with positive emotions. So how do we stop blaming? Well, this is so simple and so powerful 
that is literally, for me, it's life-changing. I still have to use it every day. Because does your, is your life full of difficult people and reversals and unexpected setbacks? Of course it is. So the only question is not what happens. You can't change that. You can change how you respond, your response ability. So nothing and no one makes you angry. There is no anger or negativity in a situation by itself. It has no emotion attached to it any more than a rock does. It is all emotion in a situation is emotion that you put into that situation by the way you interpret it to yourself, by the way you justify or identify or blame. So eliminating blame and negative emotions, eliminate them by using the law of substitution. And the law of substitution says, replace the blame thought with this affirmation, I am responsible. Now this seems so simple, and yet I still think about it and use it every day, is that it's impossible to blame, it's impossible to accept responsibility and to blame at the same time. The one cancels the other. So it's impossible to be negative and accept responsibility. It's impossible to not feel empowered when you accept responsibility. So say these words. Say, I am responsible. I am responsible. Now, I want you to think of any negative experience in your life that still causes you any anger, upset, unhappiness, and just say instead, I am responsible. Just think to yourself, I am responsible. I am responsible. Now, what I learned, which had such an impact on my mind, is that we rationalize. By rationalizing, rational lies, is we use our mind to think of all kinds of reasons why we are entitled to our negative emotions. So what we do instead is we use our mind to cancel negative emotions and to think of reasons why we should not have them. And instead of using our minds against ourselves, but by committing emotional Harry Carey, where you slice your gut and plunge the knife into yourself and make yourself unhappy and miserable, what you do is you use your mind to eliminate the expression of negative emotions. So if you think of any negative experience in your life, you just simply say, wait a minute, I am responsible. I am responsible. And then you think, in what way am I responsible? In what ways am I responsible? If you're dealing with a negative situation that you've had for a long time, the first time I recommend this to you, it's very hard because you have fallen in love with your negativity. And you don't want me talking it out of you. Come, give me that. <laughs> because people don't want to give up their negativity and so you're going to have to play with this idea and say, wait a minute, let's say you had a lousy relationship and the person treated you very, very badly and it ended with um, awful divorce and emotional stress and so on and so forth. What you do is you say, wait a minute, I'm responsible. I'm responsible. Now, how and, how and in what way could I possibly be responsible? Well, I got myself into the situation. Um, I married the person. Um, when, when it was clear it wasn't going to work out, I stayed in the situation. In fact, even before I got married, I knew that this was not a good idea, but I did it anyway because my mother expected me to. Um, and we'd already sent out the invitations. And, uh, and, I, could have, and I could have gotten out. 38% of people who get married say that if it were not for all the people coming, they'd already changed their mind. 38% of people realized they're not gonna, they're, they would have changed their mind. I had this great experience. I was uh, taking a taxi to the airport, and this... Uh, and I said to the taxi driver, I said, um, please take me to the airport. He said, where are you off to? I said, well, I'm off to Vancouver. He said, well, it's nice to pick up somebody who knows where they're going. And I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I had a fair last night. It was really interesting. He said, I was called by this woman to come to this home and pick her up. But I was supposed to go around in the alley in the back and wait, and the passenger would come out. So I drove, I found the address, and there were cars up and down both sides of the street, the lights on, a big party going on. It was in the summer. And people all over the place having a great time. And so I said, well, he went around the block and he stopped in the alley. And he waited about five or ten minutes later. This woman came running out, threw her suitcases into the uh, car and said, take me to the airport. And he said, great. And he started off the airport. And he said, where, where are you off to? She said, first plane out in whatever direction. She said, I don't care. And he said, really? He said, That's a, never, I've never had that before. He said, well, you see all those people back there? She said, that was my wedding reception. I just got married this afternoon. And I knew I shouldn't be marrying that guy. And I got home and I sat undressing, you know, cha changing her clothes after the wedding. She sitting in my room and said, my God, what a mistake I've made. This is really stupid. She said, I'm getting out of here before it goes any further. She said, take me to the airport. I'm taking the first plane out in either direction. This, and she did. Um, 
And yet, and 38% of people who get married think that way. This is by the marriage counselors, by the way, who counsel couples. They find about, um, about 38% on average, based on a study of 100,000 counseled couples, decide not to get married <laughs> because they're caught up. My point is this, is if you had a bad business deal, who got you into it? Did you go into it yourself? Did you make the decision yourself? Did you make the choice? Did you have some misgivings, but you kept on going? Or did you not find out enough information? In other words, use this brilliant mind of yours to think of all the reasons why you are responsible. And, and when, as you do that, you'll find the negativity begins to fall away. And you stop being negative about the other person. You say, hey, I'm an adult. I made some bad decisions. I was, that was really dumb. And then start telling yourself, that was a dumb decision. I was really stupid to do that. If I had done more research or I thought about it, or I listened to my intuition and so on, now you're using your mind to keep yourself calm and positive and clear. And you keep saying, hey, I am responsible. I am responsible. And as you say, I am responsible, you jerk the plug on the negative emotion tree and all your negative emotions stop. If you're having trouble go sleeping, just keep saying to yourself, I am responsible, I am responsible, I am responsible. Having trouble when you're driving around thinking about something you're mad at, just keep saying, I am responsible and find reasons why you are. And as you focus, because your mind can only think of one thing at a time, as you think of the reasons why you might be responsible in this situation, your negative emotions stop. And eventually they just stop completely and they don't come back. If you apply this, by the way, to one negative situation in your life that still makes you angry when you think about it, when you, if you apply this in a matter of a few days, each time that, that memory pops up, you, you cancel it by saying, wait a minute, I'm responsible. Within a few days, it'll stop popping up and it'll eventually die away. And you'll say, you know, I haven't thought about that situation for two or three weeks. And when it pops up, you just slap it down like whack-a-mole. You just slap it down and say, wait a minute, I'm responsible. It stops again. And soon, it's gone forever. And a situation that would have you churning and tossing and turning and up at night, within a very few days, it's gone forever. It never comes back. It's like a fire that dies away and goes stone cold. No matter how much fuel you put on it now, no matter how much you think about it, there's no emotion left. You can think about it in, in complete calmness. You can think about the person, even meet the person, even recall the situation, but there's no emotion. You've detached the, from the negative emotions. There's no emotion to it. And this is the key because when you unlock the negative emotions, then your whole life begins to explode. So we say respons responsibility versus blame. Now this is a question that we've had many times. People say, well, when you accept responsibility, isn't that accepting that you're to blame? No, we say that blame always looks backward toward the past and what cannot be changed. What he said, what she said, what he did, what she did, and if only, if only, if only he or she had done or not done something, but responsibility always looks to the future. Responsibility always asks is what can we do from here? Where do we go from here? Remember the conscious mind can only hold one thought at a time. If you're thinking about the future and where you're going and what you want to do now, you can't think of the past and what happened, what makes you unhappy. So if the thinking about the future makes you happy, gives you a sense of power, gives you a sense of freedom and control, and forces you to think about what you want. There's a wonderful line from Heller and Keller where she says, when you turn toward the sunshine, the shadows fall behind you. When you think about what you want and where you're going, all the negative things fall behind you and you stop thinking about negative things. And if you do something habitually, or if you do something repeatedly over and over again, what do you eventually develop? You develop a habit. So pretty soon you get a, develop the habit of looking on the bright side. Now this is not being Pollyanna-ish or, or pretending that there are not problems in life. It's just realizing it's only when you're calm and clear and relaxed are you really effective at responding to take care of the problems. You can't take care of problems if you're upset and angry and frustrated and lashing out at other people. And when you say, I am responsible, it's like Jesus calming the waters. When you say, I am responsible, your emotions go calm. And then you can deal effectively with whatever you have to deal with and never blame anybody else. So we say people love their suffering. And this is another thing that you're going to find. People fall in love with their suffering and it becomes habitual. How can you tell? Because they love to talk about their suffering. You meet them uh, one year apart, two years apart, three years apart. They've always got a tale of woe. They're always talking about how they're bad back and their lousy wife and their crummy kids and their boss and the economy and so on. These are, they're, they're like that Joe Blitzflick in the little Abner cartoon that walks around, he's got a storm with lightning and black clouds over his head. Wherever he goes, 
people drop dead and cars crash and people fall off of bridges and so on. There's some people like that. I had a woman working for us once and she was so negative. She'd been through a divorce and after speaking to her for a while, you really admired the intelligence of her husband. Uh, <laughs> She was so negative and so critical and so angry that she, she would walk near our photocopier and it would seize up. It was a new photocopier and it would stop working. She went out and bought a new car and she drove that new car away from the dealership and down the road and it consumed itself in flames. It literally blew up and consumed itself in flames. And she got out and stood by the side of the road. This car started smoking and it stopped and sputtered and she got out and, and flames came up and the car just burned. And they went back and they did a forensic analysis of the car and they said there was nothing wrong with the car. I mean, it's a brand new car and it's the kind of car that this never happens with. But I'll tell you, the same negative attitude that was paralyzing our photocopier whenever she went near it, just destroyed the car. I mean, she was so negative. And she was black, and all she thought about was her suffering and how badly she'd been done by, by her previous husband. It's all she could think about was uh, her, her husband. So when you meet people who uh, are uh, in love with their suffering and love to talk about their suffering, uh, what you should do is, uh, Emerson said, give them a good shake and put them back in touch with their real selves. And so Barbara and I used to call this the advice. And I'd come home and she, she was, Barbara wanted to be a counselor at one time. And she realized if you're going to be a counselor, you have to deal with people suffering all the time. So you go and deal with their suffering. You come home feeling lousy. You want to go and pull the curtains or the, the, the blankets over your head. Anyway, so she said, no, I'm not going to do that. So she, what she did is she decided to become a very quick and efficient emotional counselor. And she would give the advice. And this is the advice. If someone pours out his or her problems to you, listen, and then respond with the following you are responsible for your own life. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Whenever anybody gives you a problem, you nod, smile, and say, yes, that's all very true, uh-huh, but you're responsible for your own life. What are you going to do about it? Now, as you keep reminding that you are responsible for your own life, I'm responsible for my own life. If I'm not happy, it's up to me to change it. Tell other people, you're responsible for your life. What are you going to do about it? No, I don't want to hear about this. I don't care what he did, she did, any of this. I don't want to hear about it. Remember, when, pe when you reward people by encouraging them to talk about their problems, that's all they talk about is their problems. And pretty soon they come back and they phone you up and they call you late at night and they come over and visit you on the weekend, you become an emotional first aid station that they keep stopping at. Um, so what you do is don't encourage them. You say, well, that's really too bad, but you are responsible for your own life. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and they'll say, well, yes, yes, and they'll go, the, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but. And they'll tell you all the reasons why uh, he did, she did, he did. So, yes, I know, I heard that, but you're responsible, what are you going to do about it? And you know what will happen? Is two things. One is to say, you know, you're right. I can't sit around complaining all the time. I might as well do something. Or the second thing is to just stop coming around. They'll find that you're not a very interesting person. You're not very compassionate because you're not willing to spend half of your life while they pour out their troubles to you. Uh, so, the existence of one negative emotion that will, you will not let go of will cause you to stay in the same place, spin your wheels, and go in circles for the rest of your life. Now, this is one of the great breakthrough thoughts that I learned. First of all, you unplug all your negative emotions by just saying the words, I am responsible. Now, here's what I learned is that everybody disagrees with this. Everybody in this room agrees with this. We're all nodding and smiling. Nobody's saying, no, I'm not taking responsibility. Everybody says yes. But then they say, except for one thing except for that one person that did me dirty, except for the one. And so what they do is they, 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 they keep one. They keep one. Yeah, they keep, and they hold it, <laughs> they hold it, they hold it, and they say, I'm going to keep this one. He won't know, because I'll just smile and say, yes, no, but I'm keeping this one. That SOB, I, I, I owe him big time. And I'm not going to go, I have invested too much anger in this to let it go. <laughs> And so what psychologists have found, and Joan is a psychologist here, you'll like this, Joan, by the way, is imagine that you bought a brand new Mercedes-Benz, 450 SEL, beautiful, beautiful car, fabulous in every respect. It cost $120,000, fabulous engineering, beautiful engine, everything working perfectly. And let's say this is the front end of the car with the, with the, IB, with the uh, symbol, ta-da, and, and, and so on, and, here's the, and so on. And, um, 
And however, there was a problem in the factory, nobody picked it up, but they installed one of the brakes backwards on one of the front wheels. They installed it backwards so that that wheel would not turn. The wheel is locked in place. Now you get into the car and you start it up. And of course, you have the drivetrain, which drives the back wheels. And you start it up and you step on the gas and the car starts to move, but this wheel won't turn. It's locked in place. What will happen to the car? Yes, the car will start to go around in circles. It'll start to spin around this wheel. I've just explained to you about a four-year degree in modern psychology. Unhappy people are people who have one brake locked on. And as a result, they go around in circles all their lives. They never get ahead. They never get happy. They never get rich. They never have great relationships. They never have good health. Is yes, they're constantly going around this. The whole purpose of psychotherapy is to help people identify what that is. Whether it goes back to childhood or a relationship or an embarrassment or a shame or, or something else. But if you have one break locked in place where you have not let go, then your life will go around in circles forever. This is one of the reasons why people who have been through this process that we're talking about and finally agreed they had the courage to let it go. It takes tremendous courage to let something go that was so painful when you were young, but to have the courage to accept responsibility and emotionally walk away from it, the ability to do that sets you free. And in a short period of time, that situation is like a bag of garbage you left by the side of the road. It's gone forever. It falls off the horizon. And suddenly, your whole life, like that car now, this car can go at incredible speeds and take you to a wonderful place. Your life, like a great Mercedes-Benz, can now go to extraordinary places at great speeds if you can get rid of that one thing. But it's hard to do. It takes courage to do it. It takes character. It takes fortitude. And, and the only way you can do it is you start to work on it uh, and work on it by saying, I am responsible. And then there's one more thing that you can do, which is our next section, Ta -ta. called releasing your brakes. This is the brake that you have on. How do we release the brake? You see, if it was easy to release your brakes, everybody would be happy and joyous and popular and thin and rich. It is the brakes that we have on that are holding us back, and they are invariably psychological and emotional brakes. So what we have to learn to do is release our brakes so that we are free, so we can just fly. 